G'day and welcome to Rugby Nation episode 9, joined by Ian Payton and the great Justin Harrison. And I've been told, or you've been told off air, Justin, you can't pick your ears. Pato, welcome again. Thanks, Ash. Good weekend of footy, right? There's just the two games that had huge influence on the Australian conference and I love the Waratahs and Reds game. It was a back to a traditional rivalry. A lot of points, a lot of mistakes, but it was a great game to watch. And I actually at one stage was thinking the Reds are home here and the Waratahs found a way. Yeah, uh, Reds uh, miss five conversions, which if you tot them all up can get them past. I mean, there's a sliding doors element to that, but you're right, mate. What a cracking game, and and we've spoken about it in the past. How oftentimes these in the in the last few years these derbies have have been really dour. You know, lots of mistakes as well. What really struck me about that game was how good the execution was on uh, on both sides. So, you know, both the Wallabies coaches were all up there. Um, they would have been really pleased to see every time there was an opportunity, they got converted pretty much every time. So, um, good signs. And good, speaking of rivalries, you were back in the day when it was all about you, like Brumbies, Waratahs, Waratahs, Reds and those sort of fiery encounters. Did you see a glimpse of that in this match on the weekend? Oh, there were there signs of it. I think the, the issue with the, with the local derbies now is players know each other so well and you look at attacks don't often get a chance to execute as well as they probably do against oppositions that aren't spending uh, week in, week out, either in camp together or conversing with each other on social media. The game, I thought, was was littered with two sides showing real appetite to penetrate uh, defensive lines on first phase, real appetite to put themselves under pressure by executing skill that they wouldn't necessarily do uh, in front of the Wallaby selectors. So there was some Adventurous pieces of play, definitely two halves. You know, Reds were, were probably more dominant in the first half than they were second. Uh, key players stood up and played like test players. We come back to it all the time. You know, whenever you're sitting in front of a Wallaby coach and he's telling you how he wants you to play, I'd expect the most prevalent message is play like a test player every time you take the field. And we saw across the park several examples of test players in the making. But but one, uh, it was great to see, oh, we're talking about Israel Folau not being there, and then you get hookers catching high balls and scoring tries. So, and look, with Izzy this week, he's turned down the the opportunity to contest that ban. But Waratahs, they're going all right without him. Yeah, well, you've seen Curtly Bill really um, step back into that fifteen role with with a plum, haven't you? Um, he, he's actually played the majority of his Test career at fullback. A lot of people don't really remember that he won a John Eels medal at fullback. So. Um, it really suits him. He, he, he doesn't. He has never felt entirely comfortable or looked entirely comfortable with that front line duty of, of playmaking um, organisation. From 15, he can just pop up where he wants, and he did. He, do, he does pop up and playmake, if you know what I mean. But it's, um, yeah, he, he's doing very well. Um, the Waratahs, for mine, get a lot of value out of guys that, that don't get any headlines. Um, the Michael Wellses of the world, mm. Cam Clark, who got called into the Wallaby camp. They just keep turning up and, and, and getting it done. Um, and to me, the Waratahs' win um, came down to... Uh, in Africa, we saw them play a really high-tempo game, lots of offloading, lots of passing, lots of chancing the arm from deep in, the, in, the, in their half. And that was obviously designed to tire out the, the African forwards. But they went back to what worked when they were playing out here at the SCG. Play, kicking out of their half and just backing that defence to get the job done. And they banged over nine penalties in the last 10, 15 minutes to, to creep ahead and get the win. So, um, yeah, real pragmatism on display there, I thought, from the Waratahs. And you talk about players that... I, I really like the way Wells plays on that flank. And because he's got that seven skills, he, he's, he does a great job. But Swinton, who, who come on for the Tars as well, he's a player to watch. Like, he's a, a, probably about... 30 kilos heavier than you when you played, uh, Justin. But um, this new breed of lock that are coming through, they can just charge as sort of almost Not like a quasi six or eight. Yeah, but they, they could, mm. breaking the advantage line and, and attacking the middle of the field, I think the Waratahs did pretty well as well. So um, I think they're a team to watch. But what do you do with Bryce Hegarty missing all those kicks? Like, what, what, what's doing? Oh, look, just, you know, chewing your boot happens sometimes. I've not been, ever been a kicker, but I'd hate to do it. Um, mm. Although I did... Kick a goal over for the Brumbies, one from 100%, thank you. Where did you kick it from? Uh, well, on, on the field somewhere. Uh, and uh, look, I thought a feature of the game was the Warriors. Nick Phipps started running from, yeah. the, from the breakdown and flattening up the attack line. 
there was stages of that match where the Waratahs would make the advantage line and then go pass behind, behind, behind and take away all of that advantage. Go forward five, pass it back 20. When he started hitting Michael Hooper, Bernard Foley flat at the line or attracting one, two and three either side of the ruck, it freed up the outside backs and it freed up Kirtley Beale centre field as well. <laughs> so you started seeing that through the second half. Uh, first half, Sammy Karevi was running flat at the line, running straight. They talked about drift defence with Carmichael Hunt. Karevi didn't allow them to drift onto his legs. He's a powerful runner and he's good at exposing weak shoulder inside and out, which is why he was getting those offloads. Quick one, real quick, quick answer I need it from you. Who do you take to the World Cup out of the two Waratahs nights? You have to pick Gordon or Phipps? Phipps. That was actually the first game that I, I'd, I'd answer yeah, Phipps. I thought, I think Jake's been in much better form than Nick this year, but that was his best game yeah. in a long time. I agree. And he, um, as Gould mentions, his game has been um, very high tempo, put the ball in Bernard Foley's hands, but you need a nine to yeah. play these days in the modern game. He's good, and he's got a bit of cheek about him as Can well. Can I also, before we move on from this game, Michael Hooper How is good. just a freak. He there is. was one that the you watch, go back and watch the Alex Murphy try, which you mentioned, which pre preceding that was the Jock Campbell break down the right-hand side. That's a winger at full tilt, first fave. Who, who's there to make the tackle? Yeah. Michael Hooper. But we all Insane. forget about this, but it's always, like he, all, he played against the Sharks and everyone was saying, oh, he's too small. Mate, I'd, I'd pick him, he's the first person picked for mine, whether he's 10 kilos lighter or heavier. He's got the heart of a champion, and, that, and that's what this Wallabies is going to be about, this World Cup. It's going to be about spirit, and it's going to be about grit, and he's got it in spades. But I agree with you, mate. He is a champion. I'll throw one more point in. Samu Karevi um, is in rare form. Um, that first half try that he set up for um, Campbell um, was insane, but Waratahs did a really good job in shutting him down on the, in the second half. Um, we mentioned Wells, that hit that he put on reading the play behind the line, hitting Samu, just summed up that second half performance from the Waratahs. I tell you, just on Samu, the way he carries that ball, it, it scares me sometimes, but gee, it's effective. It's just, he's a freak. Here's but the question for you guys. You played Test Rugby. We've seen Samu struggle to take that form into Test level. Um, do you think this year is the year that you, I mean, how do you turn that guy's form away from? He has to be. You've got to pick him. I think they've, they've sampled with him at 12 and 13, but more recently at 12. He has to be the first 12 picked going into the test and you've got to build form into him. Like I think there's just no question. But exciting to even just be talking about Wallaby selections, right, and all these players that are stepping up because we've been bombarded with stuff we don't want to talk about in the press. But we'll move to the Rebels and Bulls and I'm going to go from up here and bring it down just a little bit. Rebels, all there for them to do this. They struggle against South African teams, but this was the game. Amy Park, they had some really good comms coming up to it and they fainted. Yeah, look, it's it's a classic example. The Rebels need to be playing on the front foot, getting a flat line ball, fast breakdowns. You know, I think the key, and that's that's because of their their nine or ten pairing and the style of play they need to play. Brad Cooper inside outside passing. We've talked about it all the time. Again, here being able to choose when he darts down short side and taking space, not taking space away from Quade Cooper, and that's all about speed of delivery, of breakdown, and quality of ball. I didn't feel at any stage that, that Melbourne Rebels were in control of those contact areas. The speed of ball into, into contact and out of contact for them was much slower than it was for the Bulls. And that wears you down and that's attritional mm. and it showed in the last 30 minutes. They really did fall away. And it's not about bigger packs and, and, and um, more muscle. It's about more effective in those small areas, the one percenters, ball delivery, second effort in, in, in placement, all those sorts of things that affect the outside four. Do you been good with your hands today in this interview? It's just happening and touching. Like, I'm like Ricky Bobby, I, didn't, I don't know what to do with them, so I'm just going to keep just throwing them out But there, we just spoke know. about Fanger and Jake Gordon, Will Genia. Like how he's playing some good footy too. Like, like we're just blessed with halfbacks at the moment. But he's one player that, without him, they'd be in big trouble. And even their hooking ranks at the moment. Not to put my case forward, but Rangi's. Well, been you since reckon they're they're, they're ordinary? And you oh need no, a no, call just injuries. Or? They're, they're, oh, right. they're suffering some injuries Are you available? at the moment. I'm not, not you're still your getting case. paid by the Rebels, aren't no. you? No. Aren't you on a ten-year contract? <laughs> no. I, I, look, that's why I. I I am worried about them, right? I just think that they're a side that showed so much promise. They've got such a good roster. and Well, the consistency bit is, you know, not only across the season but within games, right? They At times they look terrific when, when they get that style rolling. They For, for you know, five, ten-minute periods, they can look unstoppable, make any team look porous. Yeah. But they drop off. And that second half, 
there's, it's such a, a such a tough game, right? Because a couple of moments you get the Roscoe Speckmans of the world and just a little bit of adventure from the Bulls, which is, you know, we don't necessarily um, equate the Bulls with adventure, but they've got these terrific back three players. And before you know it, you can be pressing their line and suddenly you're on your own line and conceding tries. And that's what the Bulls did to them. They, they took two tries away. What was a close game became... You know, a, a, an easy which, which win could for the be Bulls. an unfair reflection of yeah. the Rebels' competitiveness Bulls as yeah. well. Yeah. So Bulls let's are good this year. I'd like, they're, but they're it, well, good Rebels side. don't have any South Africans in the run, run home. Yep. Sun Wolves, Waratahs. The only real danger is Crusaders. Really, there's some banana skin teams in there. Sun Wolves and Chiefs. But oh, there's okay. three out of four realistically achievable. Sun Wolves away. That's yeah, well, they're, they're, doable. Just, they're not just, bad tourists, the Rebels. Waratahs at home. Derby match looks after itself. Yeah. Crusaders. I'm not Dream as... Dream Willie Berman. Chiefs see, at home. We, I, they're I look, done. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But look, one thing about the Rebels this year, corabidi has been pretty good for them. Is he's he's he, been sporadic, do you think? Well, I think he's Hurricanes. fairly consistent. He was Marcel Marceau in the middle there. Didn't have any <laughs> well, idea who's your winger? So you're going to pick on the wing for... Well, well someone that doesn't close every time and, and offer, offer points outside him. He's learning his way into the role. He's definitely getting better. He's still learning rugby union. He's still learning about where to yep. be and how to do it. I think Maddox is is probably got one wing, wing sewn up. Banks um, at fullback. Not to say we're going to segue straight into a Wallabies starting. Where does, oh, where I would put, say Haylett you know, Petty. Just ask us. We know everybody. Haylett Petty probably. Well, you got Kurtley. Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're going to go into selections in a minute. Let's just look at the Australian Conference now. Yep. Um, the, this is really banked up. Like Brumbies, who probably six weeks ago were sitting there going, "What's going on down in Canberra?" Now they're, oh, they're clearly for mine. I'm going to ask both of you, but clearly for mine, the Brumbies will win the Australian Conference. So I think they can't be stopped from here. I don't know if it's clear. Oh, I'm clear on it. Okay. All right, let's just look at Brumbies. So they've got the Bulls. I think they'll be they're playing the Bulls at home. Mm -hmm. I think they'll be right for that. Uh, and just the way that they're playing, I just think the Rebels just. They lost their way in the second half. I think the Bulls will be entering this tour going, right, oh, we've got the win there, we can move on, and they won't be worried about this one. Then you've got Sunwolves, Waratahs. They manhandled the Waratahs when they played them there in Canberra. That is a way. And then, then Reds, that, that's my team. Oh, I think the Brumbies mm. will finish the Australian Conference as a lead, and I think the Waratahs will just scrape in and play finals as a wild card. So that's my tip for you. Are we seeing an Australian Conference that's close because... All four teams are better. Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think I actually. It's an interesting question. Well, the across, standard's gone up. Comp wise, I think. You know, you look at number I think three. Our conference to, is the most competitive. Well, yeah, not, no, but the New South African South Zealand's is competitive. Not really. Not when you look at Crusaders, Hurricanes, miles ahead of the rest. South Africa was well, last they, week. The Bulls could have, with a win, gone to the top. With a loss, gone to the bottom. So there, there's a pretty competitive all across the board, and it's an interesting question. Um, is that an increase in standard or a, or a downturn in performance? Well, I, I reckon... It, uh, you know? What are you doing that for? Because of the hands. <laughs> you go, you're going, was that an interesting... Like, you're saying, are they choking? I don't understand Probably what you're doing. subliminal you're, messaging. You should just be doing radio. I think across the... the, the I yeah, yeah I, no, but I think, I think... I actually think the standard has improved. I, and, it, and it has to work because we are beating... We've beaten some New Zealand teams. We're beating some uh, South yeah. African teams away. Like it, it has improved, yeah. and well, the, the Sunwolves have even jumped in and come. The question that probably answers, answers this, actually, Gug, is have New Zealand teams gone backwards? Because yeah. for for if if it hasn't been the rest rising, it's been New Zealand dipping. And we're, and look at that table. There's a couple of New Zealand teams down the bottom. Yeah, half, I, so I've got to argue it's us. It's not us. It's the conference rising. Yeah, I think? would agree. Yeah. I don't see New Zealand teams going backwards. I think that yeah. they New Zealand teams got the jump on. On, on footy in general post-2015 World Cup. Had a couple of good years and everyone's catch, everyone's got those levels now. They've seen where the standard's at and they're rising to it. And, um, you know, the Aussie conference, that's a good sign. I mean, it, it, it's probably a bad sign that no team's been able to take that bit and go, right, well, here's our chance to run away with it. But um, competitiveness w would be good for the... If you're a Wallabies coach, you'd be loving it. Yeah. No, and look, it's it's an exciting run home. 41-man camp of the Wallabies kept pretty secret, right? Mm. And there's a reason for it. Like, all coaches can get and, and sort of keep it away from the press. There's been no talk about this well, Wallabies team. And, yeah, and, start, yeah, we're starting to see see more talk now. I think yeah. they wanted to keep, um, keep things just... Um, under wraps a little, I think, you know, I asked for a list the other day to be able to, to run a list of that 41-man team. It was sort of said that 
look, it's not necessarily a definitive list. There are guys who aren't here that okay. probably will be in contention. There are guys who are here that are, you know, potentially there to acclimatise, get to know the playbook a bit. So it's not necessarily like, here's our top 41 right now. Um, Michael Checker works in weird and wonderful ways. I mean, you worked with him. He, he has a, a, a magic formula in his head that probably only he understands. So he's working that out now. They're doing meetings. They're doing strategy sessions. I think they even hit the field at Ballymore, did a little bit of light training together. Um, yeah. I think the concept's good bringing them together and even getting people that were so distant from the squad just to bring them in and and Michael Checker to meet them and, and get them to connect with players. It, I mean, on, watching, on right? the flip side, is that a good thing that we're four months out from the World Cup and we've still got, you know, acclimatisation to be done? I mean, in, in yeah, y- well. y- you'd like for this to just be sort of picking up where you left off and be rolling forward strongly. But, yes, uh, well, new faces. Yeah, you go through the new faces and then let's, let's have Some a of the new faces we've made aware of that are there. Um, Cam Clark, um, Alex Murphy... Chris Fayewai, Sortia, who played two yeah, tests in 2013. Tony Pulu down at the Brumbies has been to a couple of these camps, I think. Um, and then Christian Leilafano is back in the mix, which is fantastic news. Like, you know, those sort of guys, 30 years old, goal kicking 10, you know, countless super rugby caps. But a good um, he's just good oil. He's a oh, champion bloke. So. Great experience, great Did you play with knowledge. Christian? Yes, I did play with Christian. And do you understand when I say champion bloke, good for chemistry and dynamic, what... You get that right. Like he, he yeah, is, he's the heart and soul I mean, of that joint. Yeah, he's, he's, he's the bedrock that the Brumbies are, are, are basing a lot of their, their play around. He's certainly the most vocal on the field. You know, there's a lot of emotion attached with with getting him onto the field and seeing him take the field. It's important for him now to, to take that step forward. He had some time in Northern Hemisphere and probably has now started to catch up to Super Rugby again. Northern mm. Hemisphere slows you down a little, and as a back, there's a danger in that. And I, I probably feel that back end of his Super Rugby campaign has been his best since he's come yeah. back. Yeah, right. and a few people out too, uh, Gug. There's, you, know, you, you would think that Czech would have picked Samu McCaffrey. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's no surprise. He's been playing really good footy, but it's never really been in the mix. I'd injured, like to see injured, him he got injured. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to see him part of it. I, I'd just like to see him connected to it. And then you've got Rangi and Hunt, and then. The two big ins, Rob Balatini and Jordan Ulysi, and he's come back and he's playing club rugby at the moment, Jordan, but massive fan of Rob Valentini. I think they're two potential bolters. But Pete Samu's um, the interesting one. He'll go to the World Cup, I'm, I'm no doubt about that. Checker recruited him heavily and he's come into some really good form for the Brumbies. Oh, wasn't he at the camp? Uh, I think, from what I understand, Camp 2, which was in March, he couldn't make it. Um, there was an availability issue, and and that may be lingering okay. in Michael Checker's mind right. uh, in terms of he needs um, to be there. He's, he, he, he's yeah, a freak. he's he's you know, and at that point, I think he wasn't in his best form. But I think Checker's knows he's he's a quality footballer, and but when it, when push comes to shove, and they name a, a rugby championship squad in a couple of weeks, he'll be in it. Right. Um, talking of bolters, right? Back in when two thousand was it two. 2009 there was a bloke that they called Camp Dog, uh, and he was a he was a bolter by the name of George Smith. Um, he retired uh, yesterday from all forms of rugby, and I just thought maybe a good opportunity to do our throwback on George Smith. Get through this brick wall defence. Here's Smith straight through. Suddenly put the match on its head. What an asset he has been to rugby and what a great way to see. But, gee, some of these highlights that you'll see here are just going to be him. He's an absolute freak and really redefined the way people play rugby. Eddie Jones has gone on record saying he's the best he's ever seen. And I'm, I would agree with him. I think he would be the best that I've seen. Yeah, he's probably, you know, he's defied every, every uh, normal testing point for rugby uh, since the dawn of time, you know, mm. beep testing and fitness testing. How bad was he? Scant disregard. He was, <laughs> he was, he was Larry Lactic before we even pushed play on the beep test, and and even skin folds. Like yeah, skin folds. The, the, he was, he was the fattest, weakest, <laughs> unfittest, uh, legendary rugby player I've ever met. Um, yeah, uh, he he uh, he would do things that you just couldn't understand, and then just shrug it off with a yeah man, and that's what I do, man. You but, guys lived together down in the Brumbies, didn't you? You turned up. George Green tells a story that he remembers you two turning up and neither of you knew how to boil a pot of water. Uh, 
Yeah, well, it's, diffi- it's difficult in Canberra. Like, it's really cold. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Oh, look, I live with Jorge, and there was also a, one of um, uh, George's great mates, Travis Hall, um, that he was pretty close with down there, uh, tells a story that in the first few days that we looked like we'd cut a garbage bag bottom and just walked around the house. It was pretty filthy, but Phil Thompson's brought us in the line. But if you were looking back 25 years ago that you'd th- think that a, a little kid that had red peroxided hair playing junior rugby from Cromer High School, not a GPS school, that entered the fray with dreadlocks that would become one of the Wallaby greats. I think it is part of his oil and DNA. I'm glad he's entered the fray that way. And I, Are you also glad? I think he was a hooker German? when he was yeah, a kid. Was, Are you yeah. also I was glad that he looked German. I was in front of him. So really, like, I... I <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I let him. If if I wasn't better than him as a hooker, he wouldn't have played seven. And then, then you know, we don't have this. Well, here, but I, the the thing I remember was in 2013 when, out of nowhere, you know, it became known that George is back for the Lions series. It didn't end well, obviously. <laughs> Poor old George was snake dancing in that third test. But Shouldn't just matter. the buzz around when you know it became known that George was going to play, and um, I think Hooper was. Starting, so he was like, "Yep, no dramas. I'll go back to the bench." How good George is back! Yeah, you know, that like, was good from him. I remember, I remember that Hooper sort of energy there. But you got, you got to remember, one of the Brumby greats, one of the Wallaby greats, had a pretty good stint with the Reds and brought. I know he had some, there was some off-field things, but he was good in the community there and did a great job. And mate, to still be going at 39, he's he's called time. But um, we do, we do love Jorge. He's one of the greats on and off the field. Quickly catching up with the sevens. Um, interesting one London 7's coming up but it seems to be an odd movement not odd I think it's a great movement a lot of these 7's players are going back and playing club footy and getting some fitness in um, and Tim Walsh letting players go if it's not part of his plans I think Porch has now gone overseas to Connick, Connick. Connick. Yep. Yep. Um, so interesting the coach of Connick is being Connick. Andy F- Connett? Connett. 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 What did I say? Connett. Connett. Harry Connick Jr. Um, yeah, John Porch has left the program, and that's a, that's a blow to the Aussie Sevens, yeah, Sam, must be honest. He was one of the best players they had oh, last boy. year. He fell out of form, okay. um, was was left out of the team for a couple of times, and from what I told, that sort of um, sparked a bit of a, a, a period of reflection for Porchy about what he wanted to do in footy. Um, he's been to an Olympics. Um, the Sevens guys wanted to keep him around and get him back into that program, might take him to the Olympics next year, but he thought, no, I want to go and try my hand of 15 and 15s. And obviously that connection with Andy Friend has helped him land a spot over there. Yeah. So. Well, he, he, he played for North a couple of weeks back. He's got it. He's definitely got something about him. And this, what are our chances for this London team? You're still looking at this squad here. I'm looking at Lockie Anderson, Ben O'Donnell, Jesse Parahy, um, Sam Myers is back as well, so London Sevens. They've got to get there. They, they've got like to get. The, this has got to be their best tournament of the year because they're heading to Oceania qualifying um, at the end of the year to, to try and make the Olympics. So this is they've almost got to start another season now. Junior Wallabies are going to play against the Barbars tonight, yep. and they will um, before they head to the World Cup. Good to see we're talking about the stars of tomorrow but all the highlights will be on rugby.com.au as well but um, um yeah, very encouraging you know we've got clearly a redesign on the schools program the age the age group um, um, eligibility for that which led to a very successful tour over to the northern hemisphere against the irish um, teams and then you see uh, immediately junior wallabies um, performing well in a tournament that is very competitive and and not necessarily a, a late amazair to go and have that replicated in the World Cup, but what's what I'm most pleasing is that the, apparently most of the players are committed to longer term uh, rugby union franchises in Australia, which means that you know we have the next generation putting pressure on the current to to make sure that they set the standard moving forward. I certainly am a big fan of Junior Wallabies taking precedence over Super 12, uh, uh, Super Super Rugby. Uh, Squads. Yeah, and we saw that happen. Isaac Lucas, the Reds asked for Isaac Lucas to be released from camp or to go into camp late to, to play against the Waratahs. They said no. He's he's with the Junior Wallabies now. That's a that's a great thing. This this team is going to, who knows how they'll go, um, but they're certainly going with the best preparation in many years. Um, and big and the, Frosty too. Nick, Nick Frost, Frost is has back. Been added, so, um, and I think that know. Lucas call is really good. I remember um, in two thousand and eight, uh, the first thing Robbie Deans did. Uh, we went and crossed and, and covered the Super Rugby final. And were you playing in that team, New South Wales Crusaders? Yes. Deans had been appointed but had to see out the, the year. First thing he did, he came, after they'd won the tournament, his, his suit was still soaked in champagne, 
came out and spoke to the Aussie press and said, I'm sending Pocock, Cooper, uh, Rob Horn and Kirtley Beale to the under-20s instead of selecting them for the Wallabies June series. He said they're going to be leaders of that team, they're going to be leaders of the future. Um, that's my priority is they're going to play 20s. And it always stuck with me, you know, that, and they ended up making the final that year. Um, I think we've so, had the final since. Yeah, so that, uh, that to me is, is the right way to go about it and we're finally back there. That's true, that's true. And keep doing all the work you're doing with the Classic Wallabies, Gorg, and I hear yes. you're going to be on a road show, but we'll talk too. about that next week. Pato, keep covering the thanks game us. as you do. <laughs> uh, and thanks for tuning in to Rugby Nation. We'll see you here next time.